Oh, that's good, uh, Subhashish. Good to hear that. Yeah. Okay. Um, I just wanted to uh, share um, uh, just a quick thought, and it's about um, it's about um, what we read in one one Corinthians three and one Corinthians six. You know, one Corinthians six. I'm sorry, one Corinthians three. The last uh, couple of chap, the last couple of verses. Um, it. Um, sorry, verse sixteen and seventeen talks about the fact that uh, we, as believers, we are collectively the um, uh, dwelling place of God. Uh, we are collectively the uh, temple of God, right? So, um, so there's an exhortation that you are the temple of God, and uh, if and the spirit of God dwells. You know, it's not an empty temple. <laughs> the spirit of God dwells, and therefore, if anyone defiles the temple. Then God is going to be taking that very seriously. He says there's destruction coming, right? If anyone defiles the temple of God. So um, here, uh, 1 Corinthians 13 talks about uh, what is happening collectively, right? Collectively as believers. So he's saying you, and if you if you see the verse before, verses before that, he's addressing certain issues there. He's addressing um, how people are carnal. Uh, they have envy, strife, everything, um, you know, division, everything. So he's addressing that, and he's saying, you know, um, actually, uh, you cannot be carnal. Um, we are all the same. And then in the same, in the same thought, he says, you know, you are the temple of God, and the spirit of God dwells in you. So if anyone defiles this uh, temple, then God is not pleased, and there is, uh, you know, he will be destroyed. So, so he talks about something that we can do. Uh, first of all, we see that collectively we are the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit, right? Collectively, as a church, as a as a fellowship, as a family, you know, we are the dwelling place of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit does something in us collectively. Um, does a you know a, a, I don't know a different kind of work collectively among us, right? So we are the dwelling place. So in that sense, if anyone defiles the temple of God. Uh, I'm so sorry. I think that it dropped. Um, can you all hear me? It's fine. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Yeah. So we were looking at how uh, if anyone defiles that uh, temple, being the dwelling place, then um, there is the person will be destroyed, right? So if you look at that, uh, the the sixth chapter and the last two verses, there he's uh, you know he's specifically talking about how. Our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, right? How we as individuals, uh, our body is the temple of the Holy Spirit, that we, uh, in uh, the Holy Spirit of God, indwells us. And therefore, you know, we belong to him. Uh, he has purchased us. We belong to him. Therefore, do not uh, defile your body. You know, he says, uh, um, you know, you were bought at a price. Therefore, glorify God in your body. Don't do the opposite of it. Glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are God's. Right. So, so we see both applications of it, and uh, we will do well to follow both. You know, sometimes we are uh, we give more attention to the to one one Corinthians six, where we say, okay, I'm you know, the temple of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit of God dwells in me, which is a good thing. Right. Uh, and I should not defile the. I should glorify God in my body and in my spirit, uh, which is again a good thing. Right. But uh, sometimes we overlook the fact that uh, it is followed by, you know, or it is what precedes this is um, 1 Corinthians 3, where he's talking about, you know, you collectively, we collectively, and what defiles the body or causes um, desecration of the dwelling place is division, envy, strife, everything, right? And we will do well to avoid or, you know, uh, deal with those things, right? Okay, so let's pray. Father, we thank you, Lord, for this understanding that you dwell us collectively and as uh, as individuals, Lord, and um, and both are valid and uh, both are important, Lord, and um, you, uh, yeah, you just fulfill your plans and purposes, even as you do so 
uh, Lord, in both scenarios, Lord. And so we thank you, Lord. We thank you, Master. We pray that we'll be we'll give careful attention uh, to not defile uh, the temple of God, Lord, uh, to defile your dwelling place, which is um, us collectively as a people, that we will not, Lord, defile it in any way through the works of the flesh, uh, through carnality, through envy, through strife or division or quarreling or contentions. God, we pray that uh, yeah, let your shalom, Lord, rest and abide, Father God, in us, Master. And also individually, we pray, God, that uh, even as you indwell us and even as we are the temple of the, of the Holy Spirit leading us into holiness and sanctification, Lord, we pray that we'll be careful to glorify you Lord, in our body and spirit, which anyway belong to you, Lord, because we are your purchased possessions, God. We thank you. Uh, we give you all the praise and glory at this time. In Jesus' matchless name, we pray. Amen. Amen. Okay. Um, so today, uh, we're going to look at, um, we looked at uh, conflict resolution um, last class. That's what we ended with. And we said that, uh, you know, um, that we we looked at some some tools that we can use in order to you know resolve conflicts. We also saw that you know just by ignoring conflicts, it will not go away. Um, you know, we, we looked at that chart. Sorry. Um, yeah. So we saw. Um, you know, uh, what conflict, um, we looked at the chart, and let me just share that again, um, right? Um, you know, when our, when our concern for self and concern for others, you know, when that, um, that graph very clearly describes when that is high, then we choose to collaborate, work together in order to uh, reach a uh, 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 you know, discuss and reach an amicable uh, outcome, right? Something that's a win for both, right? But if it is a low concern for self, concern for others, also a low, then we would we choose to be the other extremists. We choose to be in that place of denial. Right? Okay, so we saw uh, the various aspects, various spectrum of it, and then some of those skills also to handle conflicts, right? So today we're looking at chapter ten, which is um, creativity and uh, critical thinking kind of club both together, though by themselves these two topics are quite uh, exhaustive, um, right? So, creativity, okay. So, um, this morning, if you attended the uh, mentoring hour, you know, Pastor Roshan was talking about creativity uh, in, um, yeah, in, in connection to songwriting and how um, creativity is something that. All of us as believers, you know, we have in varying de various degrees, or as human beings, we have in varying degrees because our God is the creator and he is the creative one. So uh, out of him flows creativity and out of that we have received, right? And so we reflect his image when it comes to creativity. So we see that it's something new that we bring about, we create, right? Um, something new in, in various spheres of life you know creativity can need not be just um, you know songwriting or uh, other things because normally that's what we 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 think about right creativity uh, maybe it's something like writing poems or writing songs or music or you know uh, art and so on but not necessarily you know it can be creativity is an attribute which you can have in pro in problem solving creativity is an attribute which you can you can have in administration church administration right and, and all our strategies right all our processes that we might have uh, with regard to our team and the, how we do ministry that can be you know that can be creativity there can be creativity in it right so it's um, it, we, like we saw it's the ability to make something new uh, with the help of our imagination god given imagination or some original ideas right and we also see that, you know, the difference, but we also saw the difference between creativity and innovation. Like innovation is introduction of um, or tweaking something which is already there and you innovate, you know, maybe a new uh, process, or maybe a new method of doing things, uh, maybe some new ideas of uh, achieving, you know, the 
a slightly different result um, that is innovation okay and um, Linus Pauling who's a Nobel laureate you know he says this right uh, the best way to have a good idea is to have lots of ideas which means that you know come up with uh, lots of ideas come up with a lot of um, you know possibilities and and it's not like everything we can actually implement but definitely some of it will be very effective right okay so i just wanted to share something else when it comes to you know creativity um let's say okay so we saw this okay i'm sure you would have some of you would have seen this so i just want to show this okay so what do you see right what do you see anyone you see do you see if you see a face right so yeah so if you see a face and okay we just kind of contrasted that okay and if you kind of turn it what do you see <laughs> right so um so it's the same thing you know this is what it is but when now when you you know i think it, it's, it's the same image but it now gives you a new perspective right so innovation can be like that creativity also is like that right innovation is um you know you're tweaking something which is already there but creativity is something new something fresh you know you see that um yeah the next image again you see two perspectives right a person who's actually looking to to the right and a person who's lo also looking straight right so just to show that it's um uh, different perspective right so it's a different perspective so um, all of us um, have that and more so you know when we are children when we were children you know if you if you realize that um, children are very creative when it comes to play right for them a small um, a small stool a small chair uh, it becomes a ship right it becomes a uh, you know, it becomes a racing car, and um, and if if you remember playing when you were children, it was so real to you, right? I, I remember playing, you know, with um, with my brother, and um, it was in our room, which was a very small place, and then we were there were there was one sofa there, and then the bed there, and then we said, okay, this is it, you know, this is an island, and uh, you know, there's the floor is full of water, and you know, and there's um, and this is the marsh, and uh, we have crocodiles there, so be careful. So I remember we were just you know avoiding jumping on the floor because it was full of you know crocodiles and in the water. So I remember you know my mother walking in to the house. She opened the room and we said, "Don't, you know, don't walk there." And she she was scared. She said, "What happened? You no, know, there's crocodiles there. <laughs> so don't don't step in there." For us, it was so real. Right, and creativity, you know, is uh, at its height. You know, we were just in play. So children, very, very creative, you know? um, and uh, they bring that in their play, and uh, it's 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 amazing. And what happens is we lose that sense of creativity and wonder as we grow. Okay, for some it stays, but for some it just uh, it it just it's not there because we become very, very rational in our thinking, you know, very rational, very logical, which is good, right? But we lose that sense of wonder. And sometimes this creativity, uh, when it comes to the, for which we are created, right? We are, we are, we can be, and we are called to be, and that takes a backseat. Okay. So I uh, just wanted to share, you know, just to understand um, some facts about the, our, physical organ the brain okay. these are you know scientific uh, facts which are there so th what we understand about the brain is that uh, our brains like complexity okay it's uh, it actually gets challenged by complexity and change and that's one of the reasons why you know when we see babies when you just put them uh, on the floor and you you know we have the toy which that, you know they spend hours looking at things they will spend hours um, just being engaged, you know, they see something moving. They are just engaged, right? Um, so we are, we have that 
interest in complexity. We have that curious nature uh, in us. Okay. The second thing is that when when there is learning, okay, so we feed our brain with that learning. Um, it actually gives rise to more learning. Okay, it's like it's like the Lord saying, "Not to him who has more will be given." Right. So it's like our brains are created in such a way which has patterns and and uh, the way it is formed. You know, when there is learning, when there is information about something, and when there is learning, uh, or you know, inf learning which means that you have analyzed it and you know reached certain conclusions with that in piece of information. When there is more, it gives scope to more learning. Okay, so. Um, which means that it builds on you know, uh, the, the brain builds on what is already there with the fresh information coming in so it builds those connections builds those um, you know those patterns so it's it uh, comes in right as and when new information comes in right? third thing that we see that our brains are prone to making assumptions based on existing knowledge so you have a framework of knowledge which is already there like maybe an introductory level of learning of something okay, so now when there's new things coming in our brains are created in such a way that it makes certain references it makes certain pathways and it, it's already forming conclusions based on what it's what is already you know what it already has the inter existing knowledge that it has okay so which is good which which means that when this if new information comes in it doesn't start from scratch but it builds on what is already uh, already there, right? So which means that it, it, it's faster, the learning is faster, and also it's um, uh, the 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 um, I mean whatever you're putting, it's it stays and it consolidates. Uh, you know, there's a consolidation that happens, and um, it it forms all those conclusions which are necessary, right? Okay, so uh, totally. You know, we are created in such a way as to search for meaning and connections. Okay, like some of the things that uh, you know, we see in mankind. You know, there is we we are searching for meaning. You know, let's say you uh, mankind in general, right, is already uh, always on a search, search for truth, search for meaning, right. And when we move God out of the picture, that is when the search, you know, is in all the wrong places. Right? There is a search for. Uh, truth. There is a search for meaning to make something meaningful out of our lives, right? Um, and say, you know, uh, what is the purpose of all this? So this meaning and purpose and truth is mankind's, uh, you know, real search. Okay, so that is how we are created, and it's meant to find its destiny in God, right? So. Um, our brain searches, you know, as a physical organ, there is a search for something new. There's a something for a search for meaning and connections and so on. Okay, and um, yeah, so we also see that um, there is a our brains also, you know, like to play in the sense there are puzzles, there are quizzes. If there are you know things to be identified, uh, our brain likes to play, or it's it's wired to. To be naturally, um, you know, um, I would say naturally inclined to um, to play, to learn through playing, to play as a leisure activity, etc. Right. So, having said all that, we need to look after. Okay, we need to, you know, look after. Uh, we need to protect our brain function. Okay, um, which means that um, well. Uh, it needs rest. It needs recuperation. Uh, it can handle stress, but after a prolonged season uh, or time of rest uh, or, or of stress, sorry, um, it needs rest in order to get rejuvenated, in order to recuperate and get get back to, you know, again, um, uh, you know, functioning the way it's supposed to. Right. So it's amazing. Uh, amazing way in which God has created us. God has created um, the brain, right? And uh, we we see that people say that we use a small percentage of it. You know, it's capable of much more. It's capable of much more, but we 
uh, scientists, the medical faculty say that we use a small uh, percentage of, of it only, right? Um, and there's so much that we can actually use. Um, and so the Lord has uh, created us in this amazing ways, right? Um, I just want to uh, read this scripture, uh, which talks about, um, yeah. Uh, is First is Peter, and First uh, Peter chapter uh, one and verse twenty-two. Okay, it talks about how our souls, basically, our thinking, imaginations, our you know our thought patterns and everything, can be purified. Okay. You have purified your souls in obeying the truth through the spirit, in sincere love of the brethren, etc. So, so there is a you know, if you want our brain function functioning well, if you want our thought processes and everything to be fresh and flourishing, there's something that we need to do that in when we bring our minds in subjection to the word of God, when we obey the truth. There is a purifying of the soul. When there's a purifying of our thoughts, imaginations, everything, then it it works uh, effectively the way we were designed to uh, designed to work. Okay, and also uh, another scripture that um, um, talks about how our fleshly lusts, you know, war against the soul. Okay, fleshly lusts war against the so um I'm just trying to find the reference there um, if you know the reference can you just share that please i think it's also second peter or first peter um let's just check um yeah let's first peter 2:11 i think pastor okay Okay, so we were looking at First um, Peter one twenty two, First Peter two eleven. Thanks, uh, thanks, John. I beg you, as sojourners and pilgrims, obtain abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul. So, which means that um, you know there is a battering that happens. Um, there is a damage that happens um, to this whole process of thoughts, imaginations, and everything. Um, because of fleshly lust, when we give in to fleshly lust, you know, when we uh, when we are considering fleshly lust, uh, basically it's considered to give in, right? So what happens there? There is this um, war, there is this turmoil, uh, which happens against our own thinking, our minds, imaginations, everything. So uh, it's going to it's going to create, uh, it's going to hamper. Uh, the way God designed us to function creatively. Okay, um, so one way to protect, to guard ourselves um, is well, the physical aspect of it, where we rest well, where we, you know, there's good nutrition, um, and also we use our brains because it was created to, you know, sometimes we don't, right? We think that. Uh, you know, it's it's uh, it's it's a waste of time. But then, when you use it, well, in terms of play, in terms of learning new things, um, etc., right? So when we do that, then there is a uh, we are actually protecting, looking after, nurturing our, our brain function, right? Our thoughts and everything. The second part of it is this that we can, we unnecessarily damage when we give into fleshly lusts, right? When we unnecessarily damage our own um, you know, creativity. If we we live in disobedience, but when we live in obedience, we purify our souls. Okay, that's what it says. So there, so there is a clarity that comes into our thinking. There is a you know fresh um, creativity that comes into our thoughts uh, when we actually live this this way. When we live in obedience, when we you know make sure that we don't engage in fleshly lusts of any kind. Right? Okay. So, um, how can we foster creativity? Right, we're just looking at um, 
one way by which we can foster meaning, you know, develop and nurture creatively. Okay. Um, one of the ways by which we can do is, of course, brainstorming. Okay. So brainstorming, uh, we know it's a it's a collective method of generating ideas. There are uh, like this morning we were looking at how when it comes to songwriting, we can do it in groups, right? There are instead of one idea, there are actually five or six ideas that are coming up, and uh, we can put together. Um, so there are there's more. There's always more. There's synergy, and uh, there's exponential increase when when we do it together in a team. And no wonder the Lord actually calls us the body, right? Each one having a different function, each one bringing several things um, uh, collectively when we are functioning, right? So, um, so we see that, right? So, um, the the you know the Linus Pauling again that Nobel laureate, you know, he says that okay, um, brainstorming. The thing is to generate a lot of ideas. The best way to have a good idea, he says, is to have lots of ideas. Of course, um, first part of it is idea generation okay so so if people are not judged or critiqued normally there is a lot of ideas okay but people need to understand that as part of the process not every uh, the ideas have to be evaluated okay only when we evaluate an idea can we come to a place of implementing right when we we need to assess the ideas. Uh, but step one is to make sure that everybody has their say, everybody has the freedom to speak their mind, or if they are not, you know, are not comfortable speaking, at least to write down, right? So there are several, several ways we can do this, right? Maybe it can be people writing it on post-its, like sticky notes, and putting it in several, you know, places. Maybe you want ideas on this ideas on A, ideas on B, ideas on C. So you categorize it, and then people can actually put their thoughts. Okay, maybe in a church church setting, it can be okay. Um, ideas on creative ideas on okay, let's say outreach or ideas on uh, okay, um, what can we do uh, for uh, for the you know old people in our church or for the children in our church. You know, how do we? What can we do? What else can we do? So when we have a group of, let's say, 12 or 15 people, and then we put these categories, you know, this is a idea generation day or brainstorming day. So when you put these categories, then people have, you know, in all three ideas, there's some, there are all three categories. There are, you know, 15, um, maybe, maybe one person can have more than one, and you welcome that, right? So at least we have 45 ideas come up, you know, 15 into, Three categories, forty-five ideas come up, and this is just the minimum. You know, if everyone has their say, I'm sure there will be people uh, who want who have more, more to contribute. Like so, there will be more. So you you see, you know how everything, um, you know, so much of creativity and so much of um, so many ideas can be generated, right? So the second phase is the. Um, Illustration. I mean, sorry, the evaluation of it. Okay, so you, after this free flow of ideas that are being generated, then there is the idea evaluation where we ask questions. Okay, we ask questions and say, okay, now here are some things. You know, how can we uh, can we actually do it? Is it for now, or is it for later? Right. So some of those hard questions, some of those practical questions, you know, given um, where we are right now, the resources we have, or the resources we can develop, can we do it now? Is it for now, or do we look at this a little later? Right. So things like that. Um, how much would it require? You know, okay, we want to build a rocket and send it to the moon. <laughs> You know, uh, fine. So first of all, are we called to that? You know, do you want to do that? Um, do we have the know-how? You no know, things like that. You no, know, we, we can. The thing is, we can have out-of-the-box ideas and say, let's do this, let's do that, let's start a TV channel, right? But um, the next part is the evaluation. Okay, so so when we evaluate and when we come up uh, with uh, 
uh, you know, the assessment of it, then we can actually go ahead and uh, implement it. So the leader, uh, it's good to have a leader or a facilitator who does the role of facilitation in order to guide, right? In order to uh, generate this whole process or guide this whole process, right? Okay, so uh, I, so let's do a quick exercise. Okay, so when it comes to creativity, um, I have I, I have a video to show as well, and maybe we can see uh, some parts of it. But um, I just want us to take two minutes. Okay, so an everyday object like a let's say your pencil. If you have a pencil, okay, okay, and I just want to show a pencil. So if you have one, I'll just uh, take that. Show it. Okay, I have one. I think you have a pen. Okay, you have a pen. We have a pencil. Okay, whatever it. Uh, okay, let's say a pen. Okay, it has a cap, and this is how we close it. Okay, so I, I just want you to list down uh, how many uh, how many ever uses for this pen. Okay, the most obvious one one is writing, right? But what are some uses that you can think of? Okay, using this pen okay maybe one one of these or many okay so you can you can what you can do is um, list down and then put a you know uh, I, yeah I, I think you you're putting some responses but what I wanted to do is maybe list it down in your you know um, wherever just put it as a complete list take two minutes okay so list down how many ever you want um, and then you share it here, OK? Once you've, once you've thought, OK, uh, I'll just call out the time, and then whatever you've listed, you can actually put it, right? Okay, we'll take another minute. Yeah. Okay, three times up. So, um, whatever you've written, can I just post it, please? Let's see. Okay, whatever whatever you've written. Okay, so. Okay, let's see. Um, paper clip, bookmark, marker for writing. Okay, so marker as in. Uh, Roslyn, marker. 
that we can just mark if you're reading something we can use a pen to mark oh, that's to... okay okay just to underline yeah, kind yeah, of underline. Thing. okay okay yeah, okay okay right paper clip bookmark toy <laughs> okay uh fidget spinner okay so something like that okay then as a pin so you use that on a uh, depends on a soft surface okay then paint it um beauty accessory <laughs> okay as a cosmetic okay cap can be used to draw circle okay okay nice okay who else who else john paul jackson zelitoli First, I just lost you in between. I got a call. Sorry. <laughs> okay, okay. No yes, problem. Sir. No worries. Uh, Lee Lama, Zelitoli, anything. Okay, so the thing is this, you know. Uh, now, let's say you, you were able to list down all this, right? So what really helped you to come out with these ideas? Okay, let's say we'll ask uh, Rosalind. Um, we can even scratch our head with it. Exactly. So, you know, what really helped you? Right, come out with all these options. If you just, you know, reflect, um, Zelitoli, Jeffina, anyone, you know, um, yeah, you can, Jeffina, yeah. Okay, okay but Rosalind says uh, personal experience, uh, Jeffina. Um, yeah. Uh, so I think maybe imagining, thinking a little deeper. <laughs> I even imagined pen, pen jumping, pen being thrown, and all the other thoughts came. And then I was thinking, and I was focusing on the object, thinking mm. it in various angles. What if I turn it this side? What if I turn it that side? Okay. What are the things I can separate it from? Right. Think, uh, maybe taking a closer look, and mm. then imagining all silly things that that mm. I can <laughs> somehow something finally makes. Right. Sense. Right. Yeah, so imagination, so experience. So Rosalind says experience, which means that, okay, uh, probably yeah, you have used it in all these ways. So that's that's the personal experience saying that, okay, this thing works this way, right? And um, and like you said, Jeffina, like um, taking a closer look at it and also imagination, you know, imagination again is a, a very important factor, right? Um, so what really helps us to imagine what inhab inhibits our imagination? Just think about it. What really prevents our in in imagination, inhibits? You know, I can think of a couple of things. Like one is um, maybe fear, you know, fear of being laughed at, fear of being put down. You know, it could be anything. So you, so you hold back. We withhold rather than you know, kind of unleash your imagination and thoughts. We hold back, saying, "Okay, what if? What if it doesn't work?" You know, now you never, and it is a simple thing. Pen, okay, you know. So, what what is the most that that can happen? You know, what is the you know? So you just went ahead with it. So just imagine, you know. Um, so for every problem, right? When we are uh, ministry or you know in life you know we we yes we we are there as problem solvers you know we so we are there to you know kind of provide solutions um or maybe even plan and plan ahead and do things so what if we overcame these feelings or inhibitions right and we really let loose you know, dare daring to dream right there would be so much right because you know god is for us he's with us he's for us and he has created us and he is also the god of creativity so if we would just draw from him right and uh, just let loose our our flow in our creativity you know there'll be so many options coming up just like this Right, and then uh, of course we will evaluate and say, okay, for now we will use this. But then you know, just see how many things, how many options can come in solving a particular problem, in thinking of new ways of doing things. Right, 
many times we don't even go there right because we are so inhibited by our own uh, fears second option second uh, so second factor could be um, pressure intense pressure you know fear of failure why oh, this thing has to work and so our thinking is so inhibited or limited right and so we don't think beyond the point we want to play safe and say you know i i'd rather not get into it um so all that inhibit our, inhibits our creativity okay so i i don't think we have time for the video but um to fully watch it but let me just um, yeah we have about 5 minutes we can watch it for some time and um, so this lady um, she talks about several other factors imagination is one and several other factors learning and, and knowledge and so on so we, let's uh, let's just watch it and then um, Where do these ideas come from? This is a question that I have been pondering for the last 35 years. Where do ideas come from? I started out as a neurophysiologist, poking little tiny cells with even tinier electrodes, seeing what they would tell me about creativity and innovation. After I finished my PhD, I went out to study and sort of learn all about creativity in the wild, working in big companies and small companies, even starting my own. And for the last almost 13 years I've been at Stanford teaching classes on creativity and innovation and entrepreneurship and in my classes I've done endless experiments with my students trying to figure out what is involved with unlocking creativity. What I've realized over the last few years is that we look at creativity in much too narrow a way. We really need to open the aperture and look at creativity in a very different light. And what I've done is put together a model that I'm going to basically explain to you in the next few minutes about all the things we need to unlock creativity. And I want to point out before I take it apart that this innovation engine, that's what I call it, has two parts. The inside is you, your knowledge, your imagination, your attitude. And the outside is the outside world, the resources the habitat and the culture. So let's start. Let's start where most people start. Most people start thinking about creativity by thinking about imagination. So let's start there. Now, imagination, one of the sad things is that we don't really teach people how to increase their imagination in school. And so there really are ways to increase our ability to come up with really interesting ideas. We have to go back to kindergarten to see where the problem is. If you're in kindergarten, it's very likely you'll get a question like this. What is the sum of 5 plus 5? So what's the answer to this? 10. You guys are really smart, right? Okay? We know it's 10 because there's one right answer to this problem. But what if we ask this question in a slightly different way? What if we ask what two numbers add up to 10? How many answers are this to this? Infinite. Infinite number. And this is critically important and something that many of the speakers have brought up today is that the way you ask the question determines the type of answers you get. The question you ask is the frame into which the answers will fall. And if you don't ask the question in a thoughtful way, you're not going to get really interesting answers. Consider the fact that the Copernican revolution came about by reframing the question, what if the earth is not the center of the solar system? What if the sun is? And that opened up the entire study of astronomy. But you know what? You don't have to do this in such a serious way. You can practice it every single day with jokes. Because most jokes that we tell are interesting because the frame switches in the middle of the joke. Consider this, the Pink Panther, if you've seen this movie, he walks into a hotel, there's a little dog sitting on the carpet. He says to the hotel manager, uh, "Does your dog bite?" And the manager says, "No, my dog doesn't bite." He reaches down, the dog basically attacks him. He says, "What happened?" He says, "Well, that's not my dog." <laughs> Think about it. Whenever you hear a joke, you will find that almost always it's that the frame is switched in the middle, and it's a really fun way to practice framing and reframing problems. So that's one of the ways that you can increase your imagination, but there are other ways. 
One of the key ways is to connect and combine ideas. Most inventions in the world, most innovations come from putting things together that haven't been there together before, often in really unusual and surprising ways. One of my favorite ways to practice this is with the Japanese art of shindogu. Shindogu is the art of creating unuseless inventions. They're not useful, they're not useless, they're unuseless. And what they really are is a way of saying, there might be something here, but I'm not quite sure. So in this example with uh, the umbrellas on the shoes, well, gee, it might not be very practical, but it unlocks some really, really interesting ideas. Speaking of shoes, here's another shindogu. OK, little dustpans. Again, it might not be practical, but you know what? There's an interesting idea there. Again, you can use jokes for inspiration every single day. One of my favorite things whenever I get the New Yorker, and I'm sure anyone who reads the New Yorker knows, the first thing you do is you open up the back cover and you look at the, the cartoon caption contest. The cartoon caption contest always puts things together that are not obvious, often because that are out of scale, or things that would be very, very surprising to have in the same frame. And your job is to come up with a really creative way to OK, um, thank you for being part of today's class. I posted the link there if you want to watch the rest of the video. Um, for e-learning students, I'll post it as part of the discussion so you can watch it and you can share your thoughts. OK, okay we'll continue next class. Uh, we'll, and we'll move on to critical thinking in our next class, right? OK, thank you. God bless. <laughs>